Um, it's now um, time to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Wiley Burke is the chair of the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington. Her research addresses the social, ethical, and policy implications of genetic and genomic research, genetic test evaluation, and implications of genomic health care for, for underserved populations. She's director of the University of Washington Center for Genomics and Healthcare Equality. There's more about her on your app under her bio. And her, her talk this morning is Genomic Medicine, Opportunities and Obligations. Please welcome Dr. Burke. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, I am gonna talk about the ethics of uh, pharmacogenomics um, and uh, the opportunities and challenges of genomic medicine as part of that. Um, and I wanna start by um, sort of setting a moral context here. Um, what the research, what we've been hearing about this morning, what the research uh, that's been discussed and the clinical applications uh, that have been discussed is all about is really about using new technology to achieve uh, the fundamental moral purpose of, of medicine, uh, pursuing good healthcare outcomes for patients. Um, in terms of pharmacogenomics, um, the, the premise of pharmacogenomics research uh, is uh, that we're using publicly funded dollars uh, to generate health applications based on the knowledge of genetic contributors to drug response in order to increase the safety and efficacy of drug treatment. So this kind of goal fits squarely within that moral purpose of healthcare. Um, I also want to set as part of the ethics context of what I'm about to say, some well-established principles of medical ethics, um, which, which I'll just briefly review, but I think they're fairly self-explanatory. Beneficence, performing healthcare, using new technology in order to provide benefit to patients, but always mindful of non-maleficence, the need to avoid harm, acknowledging that healthcare interventions often do involve potential for harm, respecting autonomy, the, the uh, right of individuals to make their own choices, uh, and then justice, uh, making sure that we uh, provide access uh, and appropriate distribution of benefits um, to all who can benefit. I'm going to reflect on all of those as we go. I also want to reflect on uh, what my team calls a translational cycle. Um, we're used to talking about transla translational medicine. It's often viewed as a unidirectional process in which we do basic research, we figure out something new and wonderful to do, we bring it into healthcare. Um, we would argue that, in fact, this is a cyclical process. If what you want to do is to achieve the good for patients, what you want to do is drive discovery into de development and delivery. You want to use discovery um, to, uh, to provide benefit for patients. But as you do so, you have hypotheses about benefit that always need to be tested. What are the outcomes of this translational effort? Did they achieve what we wanted them to achieve? And how do they inform the next cycle of research? Uh, and as we do so, uh, there's a real, important, uh, a real importance for reflection, for assessment and priority setting uh, as arguably a central uh, component of getting it right, of making sure that we're applying our research energies and the translation into clinical care appropriately. I want to just uh, give you a, an interesting reflection uh, from a series of interviews we did. We talked with senior uh, researchers and asked them to tell us what's research integrity. Uh, and here's an answer that I think is very important for the reflection on genomics translated from research into healthcare. Conducting research in accord with standards that make it replicable uh, and helpful. It's a study done with a clear intention of answering a question or providing a solution to a problem, not a study that will waste people's time. To some extent, this is uh, an, a reflection on the ethics of using research resources, but it also has to do with research itself 
uh, feeding the fundamental moral enterprise of healthcare. So, key questions in pharmacogenomics from that perspective. What is it that we need to know in order to deliver via the translational cycle the outcome benefits that we wish? Um, we need clearly to understand the association between variance and drug response, the strengths of the association, modifying factors, all of which will enable us to sort out what pharmacogenomic information has predictive value uh, and can in fact improve the safety and efficacy of drug treatment. Um, and as we go forward doing that, we have to make sure that our research then assesses the outcomes that we anticipate from that kind of information. I'm going to put this within the genomic uh, context and just uh, reflect upon the first reported detailed clinical interpretation of a whole genome sequence. Um, this was the Quake genome uh, reported by Stanford uh, colleagues in uh, 2012. Uh, and what's interesting about this particular analysis was um, that it was the first uh, attempt to look at the whole genome, not just to solve a rare uh, disease problem, but specifically to look at the breadth of information that any of us will have in our genome. And I want to focus for a moment on the pharmacogenetic variants and then talk about um, the implications. First of all, as already has been discussed, in all of our genomes are many, many areas of genetic variation. Uh, when the uh, group that analyzed this genome focused on uh, specific areas, they asked about uh, variation related to Mendelian disease, new mutations, pharmacogenetics. Um, they also estimated uh, common disease risk uh, by comparing what was in the genome um, with conventional risk factors. One of the points they make is that this was a huge labor-intensive process. Um, but here's the bottom line. Um, there were many rare variants. Uh, there were many carrier states. Um, there was some degree of change in common disease ris risk based on genomic information. And focusing for a moment on the pharmacogenetics, um, there were 63 known variants and six novel variants. In other words, using genomes is going to be a huge, tremendous engine uh, for understanding better one aspect of genomic medicine that has a tremendous power to benefit patients, that aspect of genomic medicine that helps us understand genetic contributors to drug response, leading to safer and more effective um, drug therapy. And there's a huge research agenda. Uh, this level of detail from a single genome tells us just how complex um, the research process is going to be. And that gets us to the first huge ethical concern in genomic medicine, in the research leading to genomic medicine, and that is the need for large databases in order to accomplish the necessary research agenda. We need sufficient power to study gene-gene and gene-environment interactions. We need biological samples or extensive characterization. We need health data. Uh, we need personal information. And we need that data to be available for data sharing. We need those kinds of resources in order to get to the bottom of the huge array of genomic variation, even just in the pharmacogenomic genes, let alone in all the other genes that have impacts for health. Um, this need for data sharing and its importance to translational medicine has been recognized for a decade. Here's the first statement from NIH on the importance of data sharing to expedite the translation of research results into knowledge, products, and procedures to, to uh, improve human health. Um, we're clearly um, uh, positioning this tremendous need in terms of the fundamental mission um, that we hope genomic research will apply. But we run into problems. Um, from an ethics perspective, the idea of putting all of our data into data banks, necessary as it is in order to achieve the goods of genomic medicine, uh, is really contrary to our traditional understanding of informed consent. The notion of voluntariness, the respect for persons involved in research, assumes that individuals have a right to be told what their participation will involve. 
based on the full knowledge of the study and make a decision to participate or not uh, based on that information. Clearly not feasible as data or samples are being put into uh, repositories. So one of our first challenges from an ethical perspective in pursuing genomic medicine is to ask, what can we do um, to, to enhance or expand upon uh, the protections uh, given how limited uh, the role of informed consent is in this context. Uh, can we allow people to make meaningful pre-authorizations? Can we do community consultations to make sure that we're building our data repositories right? What kind of oversight? What kind of governance? Should there be reconsent over time? All of these questions, I want to say, are still very live questions um, for which we do not have uh, uh, clear, uh, definitive answers. Um, I'm going to now talk a bit about um, a particular event that has raised concerns in some quarters around this issue of data sharing um, and, in fact, generated a fair amount of mistrust. This is probably, um, uh, these are probably two cases that you're generally familiar with. Um, they have to do with data sharing from data collected from two tribal communities, the Havasupai, in the U.S. Southwest and the New Chalnuth in uh, British Columbia. In both cases, uh, samples were collected for genetic research with the uh, permission of the tribes, uh, with an agreement on the part of the tribes as to what those research samples would be used for. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the samples were then de-identified, although the tribal um, uh, identifiers were not removed and used for other research purposes. Uh, on, on the one, in the one case, the Havasupai, this led to a lawsuit. Uh, in the other case, it led to a demand for a return of the samples and a cease and desist of any research with them. What, what went on? So if we can talk about uh, the Havasupai for a moment, um, the researchers who engaged the tribe in research made an agreement to do research in diabetes. Um, as I mentioned, the samples were stored. No research on the original question of any value was forthcoming, but lots of research that, in retrospect, when they found out about it, um, the tribes objected to, was pursued. Um, and yet, in the process of negotiations, the Havasupai were told, you weren't harmed, no bones were broken. What's the problem here? Um, I've told you why we need data sharing. Um, in this case, data sharing occurred um, and was strenuously objected to on the part of the people whose data was shared. Um, when we look at the views of the Havasupai people uh, about what happened, we begin to understand the fundamental ethical concern which we must pay attention to as we pursue broad data sharing to achieve um, uh, clinical goals with genomic medicine. First of all, they lied. Researchers came, took our data, told us we were going to study di uh, diabetes, but then they used it for other things. We trusted them, and they lied. Um, the other, the second quote I think is equally important. I wanted to better the tribe. I was more than willing to give my samples in order to pursue research that would benefit my people. Um, but then I found out that they didn't care about what would benefit my people. They cared about what would help them to do their work. Uh, these are fundamental issues of trust. This particular case is a dramatic one but I think it speaks to a very important ethical issue as we move forward with the huge promise of genomics. Um, we've done focus groups in an urban HMO, a largely white, highly educated population, very pro-research. Um, and interestingly, we have heard very similar concerns about trust. We don't have there the context of mistrust that led to heightened concern. Um, but we do have, uh, alongside a powerful understanding of the benefits of research, a need for researchers to respect participants. Um, federal repositories are a good idea. The idea of data sharing for efficiency makes sense. Um, 
But before you put data in for da data sharing, ask my permission. Make sure I know what you're doing with my data. Make sure it's OK. Um, I want to be asked. Um, here were some other views from our research supportive and, uh, uh, HMO members. Um, they wanted research updates. Uh, they want researchers to find a way of letting people know what's been found out. Um, they donated their time and energy, and they care. Um, interestingly, also, uh, we found that our participants had an expectation uh, of re the research process that, frankly, is an optimistic and unrealistic one, uh, a general expectation that any clinically meaningful results should and would be returned to them. So these are the kinds of expectations that these participants bring to research. Now, this issue of trust and expectations on the part of research participants um, raises some serious questions about how we do business as we do genomic research, raises questions about how we make plans for data sharing, how we incorporate participants in the decision-making process. But it's also fundamentally good news for the research enterprise. Um, because participants want to be sure good research is done. In other words, they do have that goal um, that our senior researcher told us was fundamental to research integrity. Make sure this research matters. They value how their information is used. They value how their samples are used. They also assume that they will be provided with information that could be beneficial to them. These are all challenges for the research enterprise. As we think about um, the project of genomic research, uh, I would argue that these kinds of observations tell us we need to move beyond informed consent. It's not a simple matter, matter of um, doing the right kind of global consent, making sure people said it was okay, the data goes in the biobank and then we're free and clear. Um, but the need in an ongoing fashion to acknowledge the essential role of the public, um, not only as a source of funding for research, but as a source of participants. We need to figure out how to keep participants and the general public informed as we make progress. Uh, and I would argue research governance must include the public. Stewardship of shared data resources must include the public. Now, back to the translational cycle. If we move beyond discovery into development and delivery, um, we have a number of critical decisions. Uh, again, using pharmacogenomics as a leading example of genomic medicine, we have a question that is getting more and more of concern, um, and that is, when do we do testing? Uh, we have a number of gene variants we're able to test for in discrete instances and recommendations to test when certain drugs are prescribed, but should we be moving to a more proactive approach? Should we be doing screening uh, for pharmacogenomic variants? And if we do, what technology do we use? What's currently in use is tests for discrete variants, uh, panels of tests perhaps, um, but uh, we're seeing a move to targeted gene sequencing where genes particularly important for uh, pharmacogenomics are sequenced uh, in a panel, um, but increasingly for reasons that I th think Dr. Jacob's talk makes clear, an interest in moving to whole genome, whole exome. And uh, so the question of what kind of technology to use, how to dis uh, deploy it in clinical care is a crucial research to clinical translation question. Um, and the ultimate, of course, question is, do tests improve outcome? Or, or maybe what I should say is, how do tests improve outcome? I want to just share with you um, some conversations we've been having, some focus groups that we've uh, held in Anchorage uh, with Alaska Native people, talking with them about uh, pharmacogenomics. And, uh, and we were particularly interested to talk uh, talk with them because of the reverberations of the Havasupai case in the uh, American Indian Alaska Native community and the ways in which that has led to concerns and mistrust about genomics. Um, so we talked with them about what were the potentials uh, of uh, uh, personalized medicine in the form of pharmacogenetics. 
Um, and what we heard from those focus groups was a great deal of receptivity to the idea that genomics is indeed a new technology um, that may bring lots of potential benefit in clinical care, and to not move forward would be a, a real, um, uh, a real uh, disadvantage. On the other hand, we heard cautions, and interestingly, the most important caution we heard is the fundamental development and delivery question in pharmacogenetics as long as it's cost effective and time effective. Um, make sure the tests really work. Make sure they have the predictive value that you think they have uh, and that the outcomes are what you expect. And of course, only with patient consent. Genetic testing should always be done voluntarily. Um, and, and I think this is part of that reverberation of mistrust, making sure that it is done in ways that do not involve misuse of genetic information. Fundamentally, um, our participants told us that pharmacogenetic testing would be acceptable under a variety of conditions. Um, but interestingly, interestingly the, the overarching message was community governance. Let the community be involved as this new technology comes forward. Make sure it's more clinically effective than alternatives. Comparative effectiveness. Um, does not result in reduced access, a tremendous concern about delivery of services, uh, provides broad benefits, does not conflict with spiritual values or perpetrate prejudicial views, and again, is voluntary. So, should we be doing pharmacogenetics via a whole exome or a whole genome? How do we deal with the baggage of whole genome, whole exome testing? What might be viewed as extra benefit? What might be viewed as collateral damage? All of the information the, clinical, the clinician wasn't looking for when the clinician was pursuing uh, the, the particular pharmacogenetic information that was needed. Uh, and this same question, of course, could be asked for any use of whole genome. You have the clinical question you're trying to answer, and then you have all the other stuff. So let's think about all the other stuff. Um, of course, there's a lot of information that we're not quite sure what it means yet, but within the genome, if you just look at the information where we have some understanding of the health meaning of the information, um, we have a pyramid. Up at the top are the rare, uh, highly penetrant gene variants. Some of those are for treatable conditions. Some of those are for conditions that aren't treatable, but they are at least highly predictive. Those are variants where we understand, in general, what they mean. But uh, most of the information coming from the gen genome is further down, um, and the most common information, the information that will be present in everyone's genome, is a whole ar array of weakly predictive gene variants. Um, uh, where, where most of the people who have any given variant aren't going to get the disease. Some will. Some will get the disease without the variant. How should we think about this information? And how should we use thinking about that information to help us decide when a whole genome or a whole exome is the right way to go in clinical care? In other words, um, we have a fundamental issue of getting the sequence and then deciding what information we might want to pull out of it and why. I want to use um, this particular diagram. It came from a paper uh, six or seven years ago. Um, so in that sense, it's a little out of date, but it, it gives a very important visual display of the fundamental issue in play, particularly when we think about using whole gen genomes not to extract highly penetrant information, but to extract all of the other information that's there in it. Um, <clears throat> what, this, uh, what this slide shows pictorially is a representation of the distribution of risk uh, for age-related macular degeneration based on common variants in three different genes, all of which contribute to risk, either increasing risk or decreasing risk. And what you'll see is that there are a tiny percentage of the population at each end of the spectrum. That is, um, uh, about 2% of the population has a lower than 1% risk of having age-related macular degeneration. That might be useful information for them. It might be reassuring. Um, 
And then about 1% of the population is at the other end of the distribution, having a more than 50% uh, risk of age-related macular degeneration. The primary thing we can do preventively is to tell people to avoid very bright light and to avoid smoking, but you could imagine that the people at the high end, at the higher end of risk, might also benefit perhaps from more careful, more frequent ophthalmologic uh, screening. But here's the point. Most of us are in the middle. a Little bit above average, a little bit below average. Where's the cut point? How do we decide what information is useful to people as we generate this kind of genomic information? And more importantly, who decides? Um, I want to give you just one other example to illustrate a very significant problem as we start looking at lots of genomes. This is just one example from the experience in newborn screening of SCAD, uh, one of the uh, uh, fatty acid disorders. Um, this is a disorder that was originally defined as a metabolic disorder uh, with a variety of attributed symptoms in childhood, um, uh, including developmental delay and other uh, very significant sequelae. And there is a treatment that has to do with frequent feeding and low-fat diet. But here's the point, and it's a point that has been um, understood from uh, in many instances of newborn screening, and that is we have trouble actually predicting who's going to have problems. We can identify this disorder, or maybe I should say, quote, disorder. Um, it's still included in the screening panel in 32 states, um, but it turns out that there are many individuals who appear to have the disorder by their lab. Um, but in fact don't have symptoms. And that's true in family members of seemingly affected individuals, uh, and it's true in individuals found by population screening and newborn screening processes. Um, th this is um, a problem that we can predict will expand as we look for uh, genomic, as we do genomic testing and look for conditions. In fact, the biggest risk of genomic screening is overdiagnosis. This is a, a known phenomenon from screening programs generally, and it refers to the diagnosis of a d disease based on a screening test when, in fact, many people with positive results will never have symptoms. How do we handle that problem? Um, what I'm really saying here is that genetics is complex, and the more genomic information we um, gather, the more we learn and relearn uh, that genetics is not a matter of stripes and bars and you get plaid, um, but in fact, very complicated. Um, and because it's complicated, the more genomic information we put into clinical care, um, the more we have the potential to create cascade effects from medical technology. The identification of incidental, potentially ambiguous, potentially false positive results leading to further tests and treatment, and sooner or later in some individuals leading to iatrogenic harm. This is not an argument against using genomics, it's just an acknowledgement that there is um, a, an issue uh, with excess information that needs to be taken into account as we think about the best ways to achieve good, to achieve that moral good that we're seeking to achieve of better outcomes of patients. We have another potential harm, which is if we put lots and lots of genetic risk into the clinical setting, we may just, like a big pot of glue, slow the process down as people talk over and over and um, about many issues like uh, the risk for age-related macular degeneration. What risk matters? What should we do about it? Where's the threshold? These are things we have to be cautious about. We also have to be cautious about a fundamental truism of clinical care, that complex decision-making is prone to error. All decision-making is complex, of course, um, and we train clinicians to handle complex decision-making, but I think the clinicians themselves are the first to say, let's not make it more complex than it has to. So a fundamental ethical concern in genomic medicine is to figure out what's the right level of complexity to introduce into the clinical setting. In other words, we need to think about choosing the right test. When is genomics, the, when is a whole genome, I should say, the right test? When is a targeted, sequence, a targeted gene sequencing 
the right test, just looking at certain genes, and when is the SNP panel the right test? So um, when we think then about delivering the benefit, um, what we need is to reflect upon these things. We need to generate high quality practice guidelines. We need evidence to do that. We can't produce high quality practice guidelines without good evidence, and in particular, outcome data. What happens when we use a whole genome versus a targeted gene sequencing versus a SNP panel? Um, are those concerns about um, complex decision making or having difficulty spending too much time talking about trivial risk well-founded or ill-founded? What's the outcome? And of course, as we figure out what um, what are the beneficial uses of new technology? How do we make sure that all who could benefit have access? So the Institute of Medicine has given us some guidelines for trustworthy practice guidelines. Um, and uh, it's a long list. Um, I just want to emphasize that they talk about a transparent process. They talk about attention to conflict of interest and input from all stakeholders. They are very concerned with the quality of evidence. Uh, and making sure that the evidence, the recommendations that come are well supported by the evidence um, and uh, that there's appropriate review and updating. Um, what those trustworthy guidelines support, I think, is again a fundamental concern in the ethics of healthcare. Um, we need to have uh, practice guidelines, recommendations, and healthcare decisions that we can readily explain to the general public that are morally justified, where, where we've come to a decision about the west, best way to move forward, uh, but have respected alternative views, and that we are willing to revise as new evidence comes forward. Um, we have to, in other words, make healthcare decisions in our practice guidelines that are aligned with the fundamental mission of healthcare. Um, and that is driven by healthcare needs and the potential for benefit, not, and I think this is the real issue for genomics, not by technologic imperatives, um, not by the fact that we've got new tools that we can use, but rather by uh, a, a stream of evidence that says, and here's how we can use this tool to achieve the goods that we seek to achieve. Um, and getting to good guidelines is difficult bringing people together, making sure that you have all the stakeholder inputs in place, um, that you've had effective deliberation, is not a simple process, but a crucially important one. I'll just go back to the trustworthy practice guidelines point and emphasize um, that where we are with genomics, there are two of these guidelines beyond the, the fundamentals of stakeholder engagement and transparency two of these elements that are particularly critical. Um, we need to look at what kind of evidence we have and make sure that the recommendations that we promulgate are geared to the level of evidence. What we can say as a generalization about genomic medicine is that we lack outcome data. We have a little bit of it, a, a tiny amount, but mostly what we have is great hypotheses we have great ideas about how genomics could help. Um, and we certainly have dramatic examples of the use of genomics in rare uh, conditions, small numbers of rare patients. Um, but in terms of broad use of genomics in medicine, what we have is very little in the way of outcomes. Um, and that means as we go forward, we have to be very open to updating on a regular basis. I'll just end by returning to the fundamental justice issue. Uh, again, ethics of medical care, we're talking about beneficence, we're talking about avoiding harm, we're talking about respecting individuals' preferences, but we're also talking about justice. Uh, and we have very uh, unequal access uh, to genomics, very unequal access to healthcare in our country at this time. And we have arguably less attention to some health problems than others. If we think about the translational cycle, one of the things we have to think very hard about is making sure that we're asking the right questions, making sure that when we produce through that translational cycle benefits that can help patients, that all who can 
be benefited or benefited, and as we gather the needed outcome data, um, making sure that, uh, that disparities in outcome become uh, the leading issue as we go through the next cycle of translational research. I'll just end by saying that, uh, quoting John Eisenberg, technology is rarely inherently good or bad. It's not a matter of it's always useful or never useful. Um, the question is where, when, and for whom. With pharmacogenetics specifically and with genomic medicine more broadly, um, this is a fundamental ethical question. Under what circumstances does genomic medicine help? Where and for whom? Um, what do we know today? What research do we need to do now in order to know more tomorrow about the appropriate deployment of this technology? Um, it's a long, twisting road ahead, um, but fortunately there's a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, we need to do it together. Uh, and we need to bring in uh, research participants, patients, and the general public as we do so. Thank you very much. Come on over and uh, join me over here. Thanks for that wonderful talk. It stimulated a, a lot of questions, which is, which is terrific. We've got plenty of time to, to dive into those. Um, yeah, I, was, I was struck by a comment you made near, near the end about technological imperative and the idea of not letting the, the presence of technology drive whether or not you're going to use that technology. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to come back to, to something you, you said at the beginning and then close with the idea of beneficence. How do you, you know, I, I don't know how, how schooled we all are in the ethical principles, but how does that apply here to genomic or genetic testing? Well, uh, so let me start with sort of my general working definition of beneficence um, in the context of clinical care. Uh, clinicians have an obligation to be competent, um, that is to understand the technologies that they're using and then to use that information uh, in the patient's best interest. In the case of genomics, it means that we have to be clear about what we don't know. I think we have to be clear about the fact that there are at this point only fairly narrow ways in which we can truly say, yes, we know how to use this for benefit. The, the the case that you laid out of, of the Havasupai tribe, um, in what way, one of the questions we had, in what way were ethical principles violated there? You know, here it was, they were doing something that they thought was going to benefit this tribe. What could possibly be wrong with that? Right. So, um, so I think the Havasupai case is a very instructive one, and I want to um, re refer again to the quote that I, that I gave, they lied to us. Um, that was, when researchers <laughs> lie to participants, that's a problem. That's a, I would say, a fundamental problem. Um, but in fact, what happened was uh, the tribe was very interested in diabetes research and agreed to have that research go forward. What happened was the researchers gathered the samples, but did so under individual, rather global consents, so that under the regulations, under the common rule, um, that governs human subject research in the United States, nothing illegal was done um, when the samples were de-identified and used for other purposes. But clearly something unethical was done um, because there had been clear understandings with the tribe about what the samples were to be used for. We give our permission to use samples for diabetes research because we want that research to go forward. There was no discussion about other uses. So the fact that there was potential benefit to the tribe for other disorders, that, that doesn't play a role in terms of the ethical principle? I am not sure any case can be made for potential benefit from the other um, uses. So I, 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 perhaps there are people who care to make that argument, but I don't believe it would be well supported. Um, let me, let me uh, ask you a question that, that it kind of relates to that, but it takes it down to the top doctor-patient uh, interaction. And uh, here's the situation. A doctor ordered a pharmacogenetic test. The test was run on a chip that includes known risk factors for, for uh, thrombophilia, and the patient was, has significantly elevated risk. But that wasn't the test that the patient had agreed to have performed. Should that risk be reported? Well, so already we're phrasing the question um, the way the question is phrased says that we have a problem. So um, I, I would say um, 
two things about that. The first is I wouldn't want that patient to have the test without knowing that was a potential outcome or at least knowing that a potential outcome of the test was additional information about risk. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is having found oneself in that very difficult situation of having information you didn't anticipate, um, one has to go very respectfully back to the patient, I think, and explain what happened. Explain the situation and whether they, they would like that, that right. additional information. Right. Um, when you take the issues from the patient and their own decisions down to the, the situation of testing that's done for their children, um, how does that affect the, the ethical principles and, and, and who's making decisions? So we, we, I think this came up in an earlier talk as well, this issue of what genetic information should we collect on children um, and who decides. Uh, and there is a, a, a settled consensus, I would say, in pediatrics and amongst bioethicists that, that as a general rule, we should avoid gathering information about genetic risk in children um, when there is nothing to do about that risk in childhood. Uh, and the reason for that, the, the driving force behind that, uh, and I would certainly support this reasoning, is that we want to preserve the child's autonomous decision making. If, if it's a question about BRCA testing, um, we'd like the child to decide whether or not to pursue that testing at a time when it can be important in terms of their health care, that is, as an adult. And I would just say that's better care, too. You want the child engaged in that decision process so that they're engaged in using the information. Uh, this is getting back to the Havasupe, I think. You mentioned many issues where studies have been done incorrectly by not informing uh, patient populations up front. How do we best avoid this in the future? It's, it's happened in many other instances in the past. I, I don't want to claim that I have a magic fix to this problem. <laughs> um, what I would just say is I think we need to recognize that this problem is important, and I would underscore the importance of work developing ways to engage participants, communities, the general public in governance of the research process. We need to ask the public to help us. How do, we, how do we govern the research process to avoid this kind of problem? Uh, you, had, you had mentioned uh, the issue of, of, of underserved populations, expensive technology. How, how do you ensure that that reaches all populations? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if the past predicts the future, the, the likelihood is this is a technology that will not reach the underserved mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, how do we move forward with this technology so as not to make so many of the, the, the same mistakes? Uh, I think you're, you've just articulated what I would call a, a fundamental concern, a fundamental bioethical concern with delivery of clinical care. I, I think there are a couple of things um, to think about. Um, one is that when we think about what questions matter, what research should we be doing, what research questions should we be pursuing, cost-effective solutions matter. So the more cost-effective a solution is, um, the more likely it's going to get broadly used and the more likely it's going to get to low-resource settings. Delivery in low-resource settings needs to be considered. Um, beyond that, I think we're talking about a problem that's much bigger than genomics. Uh, what's the role of ethics when patient autonomy, uh, with patient autonomy when many patients do not follow basic lifestyle choices and assume risks, diet, smoking, et cetera. What's the patient's role in their health in shared decision making? I think what's implied here when they make the wrong decisions. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the issue of the patient who's not pursuing the healthy lifestyle that we, we want that patient to pursue um, is, is, a, is a twofold issue. I, I think we have to deal with all patients with the same level of respect. We have to do our best to understand how they're making them, why they're making the decisions they're making, and we just need to see what kind of incremental help we can provide in getting them um, to a better situation. Most patients, for example, who smoke um, would rather not smoke. Uh, and keeping the conversation going, 
may be the most important thing we can do. Um, exploring what it is that makes it hard for them to quit may be the most important thing to do. This is a, a, a question about healthcare dollar allocation, resource allocation, I think on the resource, in the research front as well as in the, in the clinical side. But can you discuss the cost of genomic medicine as another aspect of ethics? In other words, genomic medicine is very expensive. It benefits very few patients, while the biggest challenge in healthcare is access for the masses. Is genomics the right way to spend our Medicaid, Medicare, and, and, and other dollars? Uh, I, I think the point that, that that question makes is we're not ready for whole genomes for everybody. <laughs> that would not be, uh, we, we can't deliver enough benefit from that information to make that cost effective or an appropriate resource. That is not to detract in any way from the importance of research on genomics, uh, including research that involves getting genome sequences on many people because one of the biggest gains from genomics, I would predict, is not so much developing genetic susceptibility profiles, but understanding at a much more precise level than we do now all of the diseases we want to improve. Understanding diabetes at a molecular level, getting us to better drugs, perhaps, but maybe even more important, better prevention, better surveillance that enables us to catch people early. Um, so genomic research matters, and it should come into the clinic when it's, when it's proven benefit. So you're thinking at genomics at a, at a population level, a public health level, might lead to, to approaches to prevention that, that do rival other cost-effective strategies? Well, if I, I mean, we all look into our crystal balls and we wonder what's going to happen. My own pr particular, my own personal prediction is that genomics at a public health level is going to be far more important explicating disease than as a test for individuals. That would be my prediction. But research is needed. Uh, now here you're going to have to help in interpret some of this question. Does the draft NHGRI genomics data sharing policy that just came out this month address issues that weren't accounted for in the previous policy you mentioned? If so, what, what issues? Is, is, what is this new policy, and is, is it an improvement that, that covers some of the, the areas you had concerns of? Well, I, I think the new policy, as I read it, and I'm still poring over it, as I'm sure many are, others are, is an extension of the GWAS policy that was promulgated in 2007 um, to a broader array of genomic uh, data. Uh, so in that sense, it's simply extending in the way that technology is extending. Uh, I think it's a little clearer on some of the processes about submission, um, but the most important has to do with uh, global consent. Um, that is, um, this particular policy emphasizes the importance of making sure that we get a global consent that is a consent for data to go in and be widely shared before the data go in, and it proposes this as a standard. I think that does address the issue of ask me first, don't, don't take it without asking me. Um, what it doesn't address, and I think this is going to be a, a complex issue to sort out, is that many pe people may not be comfortable with global consent. And so the question really is, if we insist on global consent, does that mean we end up with biased samples because there are people or potentially populations that are not comfortable with that approach. Mm -hmm. uh, must include the public. This was a, a concept in terms of developing guidelines and ways forward. It, it, this, this questioner says, is, is all well and good, but aren't public panelists likely to be pre-selected for a favorable disposition toward research rather than being truly representative? You're, you're kind of coming out of what, what, what you just said. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, it's one thing to say public representation. It's another thing to figure out how to do it in a meaningful way. Um, having the token member of the public, who in fact is very engaged in the research enterprise, is not necessarily the solution. I think what we're seeing is a science of uh, deliberation, techniques develop, methods for public de deliberation that may be uh, much more effective at generating true consensus and true public input. So it's a, it's a, it's a technologic issue too.
Um, what do you think of the direct-to-consumer, like 23andMe model for returning results to customers and gaining research consent? So, I, I'm, uh, I, what I will say about 23andMe, and I don't want to say that I'm um, deeply knowledgeable about their model, uh, is that I think at this point they do a very good job, they do a wonderful job of returning the information from their tests. I think. I think uh, the clinical enterprise has much to learn about from the ways in which they present data to try and make it meaningful to their participants. Um, they are, it's my understanding, attentive to um, uh, making sure that they ask before data are used in research, and so they're meeting that bottom line. Um, whether or not they're giving people enough information to fully understand the implications of research versus personal information, data sharing, et cetera, I, I'm not in a position to judge. I would just say those need to be looked at very carefully. Uh, the questions are still flying in here. Uh, why is it unrealistic to expect that clinically relevant data will be returned to the participant? Uh, I certainly would never participate in a study where I didn't get to know uh, what you found out about me. Uh, I appreciate the question. I think that's what our focus group participants told us. Um, but I guess I'd be interested to hear from the researchers in the audience. My impression is there's not a lot of returning of results going on. Why, why is that? I, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to figure out what should be returned. In some cases, I've known of instances where researchers wanted to return and the IRB wouldn't permit them. Um, so I, I, it's a complicated issue. I think the good news is that very much in keeping with the comment, um, this is getting to be a very high profile issue. Mm -hmm. So I think figuring out what results should be returned and then how to do it is, is likely to occur. Uh, we hear a great deal about genomics as applied to cancer, but what about common forms of mental illness? How will genomics help clinicians identify various issues related to mental health, and does that raise other ethical issues? Uh, I, I think the question of how genomics could be helpful in mental health is a big question mark. We know that genetic predispositions are important in some uh, mental health problems. Depression uh, and schizophrenia are two examples. Uh, but whether predictive uh, information would be helpful is a big question. Pharmacogenetics is another area where we have some reason to think that uh, genetic testing will help to prescribe drugs more effectively, so that's an important area of research. The issue, of course, is always that of stigma. Um, to what extent will gene variants associated with any kind of risk for mental illness be viewed as stigmatizing and carry more harm than benefit? You know, at, at, at present, the regulatory uh, uh, climate around genomic testing it has a lot of holes in it mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of insurance and uh, ability to get insur long-term insurance and, and other issues should, should conditions be, fine, be found. How does the regulatory and ethical circles in, intersect? So regulation and the laws that inform regulation, um, we hope, form a floor. They're the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the minimum we need to do. Uh, and uh, what I think we're commonly um, accustomed to thinking about in bioethics is, and how can we do more? How can we be more responsible? Um, so the question for regulation really has to do with, is our floor solid? Uh, and I think you've just uh, referred to places where it looks like it's a little spotty. Um, so we have the Genetic Inform Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, it prevents discrimination in employment and health insurance decisions should we also be protecting these other decisions, a matter for public deliberation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Burke for uh, a wonderful talk and, and uh, question time. Thank you so much.